Hello and welcome to this critical care teaching video. If you've spent any time in a neurocritical care unit working with patients with any form of brain injury, you will no doubt have noticed that fluid balance and sodium balance can become very challenging for our patients. This is broadly due to one of three different problems. Cranial diabetes insipidus, cerebral salt wasting, and the syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone. Cranial diabetes insipidus is due to the loss of antidiuretic hormone release from the posterior pituitary. This results in profuse loss of water from the kidneys. Our patients are therefore hypovolemic and polyuric. Our blood tests will show high levels of sodium, hypernatremia and dehydration. And our urine test tests typically show low or normal urinary sodium levels, but the urine is very dilute with a low osmolality. The treatment of cranial diabetes insipidus is simply replacing what is lost. And this typically means prescribing desmopressin or DDABP. The dose given depends upon route. Typically within intensive care, in an acute case of diabetes insipidus, I'll seek to replace antidiuretic hormone, either intravenously or subcutaneously, starting at around one microgram over the first 24 hours, titrating to effect. Longer chronic term patients will usually have their DDAVP given by nasal spray or oral tablet. In cerebral salt wasting, we also see profound extracellular volume loss. This is thought to be due to an abnormality in renal sodium transport, and it is a diagnosis of exclusion. We should be looking to prove that the patients we think have cerebral salt wasting have normal adrenal and thyroid function before giving them this label. It typically occurs in patients with intracranial disease, and most commonly in my experience, I've seen it after patients have suffered a subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's also known in the literature as renal salt wasting. The underlying pathophysiology with cerebral salt wasting is not fully understood. And in fact, some authorities don't believe it to be a separate entity at all, despite it being originally described in 1950. It's possibly due to an abnormality in the proximal convoluted tubule. It may be due to high levels of plasma natriuretic peptides. At this point in time, we simply don't have it nailed down. However, we can see that our patients become profoundly hypovolemic and polyuric. They have low levels of serum sodium and they are very dehydrated. Urinary tests show very high levels of urinary sodium. In terms of treatment, we should seek to replace the lost fluid and sodium. Closely monitor the urine output of your patient one rule of thumb is whatever they've peed in the last hour, you should seek to replace in the next hour. You should also check thyroid and adrenal function and make sure you're not actually looking at the consequence of another previously undiagnosed endocrine problem. And then it's simply a matter of waiting. In my experience, again, cerebral salt wasting will typically improve within a week. Finally, then, we've got the syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion. And there are six broad categories of causes of SIADH. These are central nervous system disease, certain cancers, certain lung disease, various drugs, genetic abnormalities, and a few miscellaneous transient conditions. If you look at these causes in more detail, within cancers, it's typically lung cancer, in particular small cell lung cancer, as well as gastrointestinal and genitourinary cancers along with lymphoma and sarcomas. Suppurative lung disease, such as infection, pulmonary abscess, and cystic fibrosis can cause SADH, along with chronic asthma. Certain drugs, such as SSRIs, morphine, and amitriptyline can cause SADH, along with ecstasy, or more appropriately, MDMA. And there are certain transient causes, such as endurance exercise and general anesthesia. Our patients tend to be euvolemic or perhaps very slightly hypervolemic. They will usually have a normal or perhaps slightly low urine output, but blood tests will often show a profound hyponatremia and urine tests will show high levels of urinary sodium. The urine tends to be quite concentrated as well. 
treatment of SIDH is initially by fluid restriction. If this alone isn't enough, drugs such as dimeclocycline and ADH antagonists can be given. Urea has been described as being a potential benefit to patients, but it tastes fairly unpleasant and it can put people who are at risk of hepatic encephalopathy over the edge. Vasopressin antagonists can also be given. In this slide, I've sought to summarise and contrast these three different diseases. In cranial diabetes insipidus and cerebral salt wasting, our patients are dehydrated with high urinary outputs. This is in contrast to SIADH, where patients are usually euvolemic or potentially slightly overloaded with a low urinary output. To differentiate cranial diabetes insipidus from cerebral salt wasting, look at serum and urine uh, sodium levels. The serum sodium level will be high in cranial diabetes insipidus, whereas it will be low in cerebral salt wasting, and urinary sodium levels are typically normal in cranial diabetes insipidus, whereas they are very high in cerebral salt wasting. I hope you found this video useful. If you do have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment, leave them down below, and I hope to see you on the next one.